Welcome back to another episode of Out of Bounds on the Boomer Bus channel. I'm your host, Terry, and today talking a little bit about financial literacy, um, especially as it pertains to the African-American and uh, Black community. Um, I have a guest with me today, and we're just going to have kind of like an open discussion. We uh, both kind of came up in the uh, same time in school early on, then we kind of went our separate ways later on, but we reconnected as adults, so we kind of have some of those same experiences but uh yeah we just kind of want to give you our experience and our take on everything so um for me personally i think as we're in the middle of uh seeing a lot of change seeing a lot of people demand um a different treatment for our communities i think one of the biggest things as far as empowering ourselves is the financial literacy part um, because i think a lot of people but us especially we don't always grow up hearing that um, as far as what things to look for or what type of things we should be doing. And so that's how I feel about it anyway. But um, did you feel that way growing up as well? Definitely, definitely. Um, growing up, uh, definitely didn't. You only see one side, I guess, of, of, of the financial market um, in our community, especially I believe we were taught to be consumers uh, more so than providers or, you know, suppliers. Um, and, and so with the supply side, you got a lot of investment in, uh, in financial literacy that needs to be there. Whereas with the consumer, you're, you're, you're just, you know, you're the group that's being marketed to, you're the person that's shelling the money out. So I think definitely the black community as a whole um, has been being steered towards one side of that financial uh, process and away from another side, but definitely with the empowerment that we see today, um, you know, I, I, would, I would hope that we would all take advantage of, of these openings that I feel we are starting to get into where, where everybody's starting to see, hey, there's another side to it all that, that we haven't been privy to. Yeah, when you say that, the first thing I think about is like clothing brands, especially because we always like, well, not always, but sometimes you would hear like, why is this popular? Or somebody be like, why is this popular? Like, man, because it is like, that's what. That's what people say. And so we spend the money sometimes without thinking, especially before we had like internet. It was like, this is what's popular. You know, either it's an influencer, like a rapper or an actor or somebody. And that's what's popular now. And so we are gonna spend our money on that. And you know, that marketing, that, that just is, is shot at a, us and is targeted for us. But we never really, you know, took the time to be like, well, we could put out our own stuff and make it popular. So, uh, you know, being a consumer part of it is definitely, uh, I agree with you on that. No, definitely, definitely. And I think, I think it's a little bit more orchestrated than, you know, what we've not, what we've acknowledged in the past. Um, ever since, I think you look at uh, desegregation in America, I think you see a big, um, shift in, in the black consciousness where we went from having our own community, uh, having our own businesses to trying to, you know, be a part of what's popular, you know, and so we got into trying to uh, look the part with fashion, uh, spending on having the specific type of cars, and I think we that, that individuality mindset that we had that made us great uh, investors, that made us great businessmen, uh, so we started to lose that. And I mean, you see it still even present in Jewish communities um, and especially in like different communities that have their own identity. They're, they're very uh, particular about how their dollars flow and stay within the community, how much wealth is generated by that community prior to that wealth leaving. So it's just there's certain aspects that we've lost or uh, wasn't privy to. And, and definitely we uh, it's time for us to get back to it. And I think like, for me that that's one of the um that's one of the symptoms of kind of what our history has been in this country you know um pulling us away from our roots where a lot of us don't really know exactly where we come from in africa we just know we come from africa so there's no connection there and then again like i said before internet social media it was everything was so based on where you lived and so you had your own particular style in this city, your own particular flavor. And 
um, you know, there's a lot of other parts that go into it, but I think that plays into this idea of it's not us, like, as a collective. It's us here in Chicago or it's us here right here, but I don't care about y'all over there. I'm not buying from y'all over there. And so we never had this sense, like you said, other communities where we only buy from us or, you know, we contribute to things that goes back into our community. Right. And in I mean, I 100 percent agree with you there. And, and I think that, too, there's this because I know growing up and, you know, at where we grew up in, in Chicago Heights area, um, you know, I remember going spot to spots and my, my mom being like, uh, I'm not going there. It's, it's, you know, it's a black spot. And I'm like thinking to myself, we're black. Why wouldn't we shop there? You know what I mean? Or, um, you know, she'd rather go spend her money with another group. You know, and knowing that that group practices group economics and still think it was acceptable. And I'm not calling my mom out on this because definitely um, there were some quality issues even. You know what I mean? That she was saying that, you know, she didn't receive the best customer service when she shopped within her own community. Um, she didn't receive the best quality of, of, of you know, goods at times. So she was kind of turned off to shopping with, uh, you know, in the black community and started going and shopping in other communities. And so that I think there's, you know, that speaks to itself as well, that, you know, as a part of um, us as a people, you know, we get into, and I, I may be going on a little bit of an offshoot here, but we get into this mindset where, you know, oh, I'm expecting to get the best of the best from, you know, if, it, if I'm going to buy black, it's got to be the best of the best. That doesn't make sense because we'll go buy something cheap from Walmart. You know what I mean? But yet we won't go buy the same type of quality from from our own people or we want a discount that's the other problem you know it's like but we'll go pay top dollar in another community but we won't pay top dollar in our own community and so it just you know a mindset shift that kind of needs to take place and i think we starting to get there um with a lot of technology people are becoming more conscious um i think not just us but people in general where you never really had this idea of, oh, you know, the owner or the CEO does this or this person believes in this or so I'm not shopping there or I'm not patronizing them. That that wasn't widespread like it is now because you got access to find out more about people. And there's a more of a push now about, you know, support black owned and everything. But um, I, I think that's really where it starts is that we have access to this information and it's a lot easier. Like I don't have to go to New York for this, you know, place that makes all this cool stuff and it's black owned. I could, you know, PayPal or I could pay them online or I could cash app them and they could send it to me. People are a lot more mobile in making their own business now because you don't have the same restraints you know what i mean you right. can get paid pretty easy with these applications and you just you make your own stuff and send it out no definitely and and i think too there's a little bit of a uh, confidence man like i definitely think like you you said it multiple times in this time that we're in you know what i mean and i think that there's a there's a level of confidence that we're starting to see what the black dollar is actually worth because when you really think about it you know um our money has value you know, if every if every black consumer stopped consuming, um, we could really hurt a lot of different businesses, a lot of different industries. And so um, I think that we're starting to recognize that and we're starting to see that because of how quickly, you know, we would uh, take our black dollars and send them out of our communities and how detrimental that was to our communities. And we're starting to recognize that I think we're starting to get that literacy or, or at least look for the literacy where we can kind of fix the problem that was created. And like I said, I think con the number one thing that hurt that because it was you know in the sig once once segregation ended it became you were you were something if you went and spent your money elsewhere you know you were somebody if you go and buy this this brand or if you purchase this stuff from here and you know it was really there was a lot of uh you know it's almost like a sunday best type of competition that we were getting out of spending right you were you were the man if you could spend more and i think today we're starting to get away from understanding, hey, you know, I got money, you know, I'm gonna spend it all into what it really means to have money and wealth. And we're starting to understand things like uh, investing in the housing market and the stock market and 401ks and things of that nature, where if you really have wealth, that's the places where you actually get wealth and where you keep your wealth, not in cash or in jewelry or, you know, having the best car on the block. Yeah, I, I'm a, I wanna put a pin in that, I'm gonna come right back to that. But I think what's important 
is that two things you said, uh, I think we both agree we're starting to realize the power of the black dollar. And a lot of people, because you said we've been taught to be consumers, but now we're realizing as a collective, we can shift what people do in a certain sense. And that's, I think, where cancel culture, that's where a lot of things come from, where it's like, we're the consumers and we're not going to spend with you if you don't act accordingly. And I think that's the first level. But like you said earlier, we have to start thinking about being suppliers because that's the ultimate level. Like, you know, cancel culture is kind of a facade on our side because it's like if a bunch of us tweet something, that's cool. But if it's just me, you know, it's whatever. But if I'm the owner of that business, I, I don't have to wait for, you know, back in to cancel somebody. I actually have the power to cancel them. And that's right. the next level we got to get to. But um, kind of taking it back, like if we rewind it back to being younger, um, you kind of hit it on some of those things. But if we talk about some of the lessons that we think would really have impacted us or can impact this generation now. Um, I think the first thing you talked about was this idea that at least for us growing up, we were taught putting money out, like having money just so you can spend it and put it out into the system. That was the symbol of success. We were never taught that actual wealth was to keep money. (laughs) You know what I mean? It was always just spend the money so right. uh, yeah did you feel that way and kind of what do you think how, how can we change that conversation uh definitely bro um yeah I, it's hard it, i guess it's uh i guess not hard but it, it definitely um kind of makes me cringe a little bit when i think about as i was getting as i was getting older and even my parents they've changed their mindset on it as well because it, as we know um you know we're only especially in the 90s we were only what 20 some years out of segregation and so many years out of Jim Crow, so many years out of slavery. So, I mean, we still were early on in a lot of, of these understandings. Um, so I definitely don't want to make it seem like, you know, I'm calling us out as, hey, it's our fault, you know, because we just lack something, right? I mean, we know we yeah. were held held out of a lot of this stuff, right? It was kept away from us. But uh, early on, I remember, you know, looking at the way my parents um, and their friends, and my parents definitely were the ones that shifted me away from even thinking this way. But just from the, the environment I was in, having being able to walk around with a thousand dollars in your hand, or whoever walked around with the most cash in their hand, that's the one that had it going on. Whoever had, you know, the most uh, expensive name brand on it was the best. If your parents drove the best car with the best emblem on it, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And you know, you had it going on. And definitely at the time, and I think two are one thing. And I, I just to take a quick step back. Um, one thing we got to also realize is that black culture is drives American culture, right? I mean, yeah. we know this from looking at the way culture uh, develops. Black people have always been influences in culture. And especially when you talk about, you know, hip hop in the 90s and early 2000s. I mean, that's what the rappers were showing us, right? That's what the rappers were putting out to us that uh, you ain't somebody unless you got... Uh, you know, stacks in your hand or unless you're able to purchase this or you're able to yeah. wear this, you know, so Cash that's definitely money, early big on. timers. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, it, it's uh, definitely, you know, we were judged by what name, what what clothes you had on, what shoes did you have on? Could you afford Jordans? Um, you know, did you have the latest of this? And and so at the end of the day, you know, as kids, we, we missed out on a lot of learning that, and I'm not going to say white people do the same because I've lived in some white neighborhoods where they kids are just as confused as our kids are. The difference is mm-hmm. though is that as they kids grow, they kind of steer their kids away from that. Whereas with us, you know, you can only teach what you know. And for a lot of our parents, like I said, I go back to that Sunday best mentality. You know, uh, if I could look the best, then um, or better than somebody else, then that means I'm I am better or that I am got it got it going better, right? Uh, so. Yeah. Just breaking it down, like one thing I do with my son actually is, uh, you know, my little, my son cuts grass, and uh, he cuts about three different people in the neighborhood. He cuts their grass for him, and they pay him twenty dollars uh, for the whole yard. You know, I do the quality control, make sure it's all good, and, and he takes five hundred dollars and gives them to me. And the reason why is because he uses my lawnmower, and I have to keep gas in it, right? 
So mm-hmm. now some people are like, man, why you take that little boy five dollars for every yard he cuts? Well, I'm teaching them business principles. You know, I'm teaching them about capital. I'm teaching about some of these different things. But what I'm doing with that five is I take it and put it into an investment account, which he knows about. He knows that that's where his money's going into. Uh, and, and that best investment account is what he's going to use to buy his first bill. You know, so um, these are the type of things that I wish that more of our parents taught us, right? Because this is something my dad did do with me when I was younger, um, and which, which I'm very appreciative of because he taught me a lot about business. Um, but now I'm doing the same with my son. And this is, this is the type of thing we should do as parents to teach our kids because my son came home talking about he wanted to spend $300 on some Jordans. And I looked at him and I said, son, I'm 29 years old and I have never owned a pair of Jordans. I own a house, I own two vehicles, you know, and I've never owned a pair of Jordans. And he goes, dad, why man, Jordans, you know, you gotta have a drip, dad, you know? And I'm like, look, look, son, um, I can tell you what you could do with Jordans or I could go buy some $90 Nikes, which is still very nice shoes, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. I can take that extra, whatever, a couple hundred, and I can go invest it in Nike or invest it in Jordan. And now I have ownership of some of that, right? So they're going to pay me. And he looked at me and he goes, Dad, I think I want to do that instead of, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of where we need to steer our kids to and, and start having them think about. Yeah, you said a couple important parts. Like uh, I mentioned at the beginning, it's not just a black people thing, but we are impacted different because of cultural capital. Like you said, um, it might be the same when we're younger or kind of when we grow up, but the odds are for somebody that's, you know, Caucasian, they're going to have somebody in their family or within their means that can uh, steer them in the right direction or get them access to that information. Um, Not to say it's everybody, but the odds odds are greater. Like my dad did um, something similar. He did like these things where... um, we had to give him money, like he used to call it dad's bank or something like that. And I, I didn't understand it. And then eventually after time, when we asked for money, it would grow if he gave me the money and he kept it long enough. But he didn't really have that education to explain what was happening. So like, right. I got a little bit of the concept, but I didn't really fully understand what it was. And so again, that goes back to the cultural capital more times than not in our community we have people that aren't as educated we have people that haven't been exposed to that knowledge and so it's hard to pass on to other people and um i frame it a lot like education because i talk a lot about education that's my field and where i always talk about grades with um young students we have to reframe how we talk about grades because a lot of people, we tell you winning in grades is getting this letter. I got right. that letter, so I'm smart, I'm good. And that's not really what education is. It should be about you win when you learn something, when you actually right. know something. And I think the same way about this, we have to, to me, winning was having the money, like having the money to spend. If right. I can afford these products, we were never taught that winning was keeping money. Like that was opposite, that's losing to me. So like I get a job and they say, hey, you could put this much money into a savings account or into a tax shelter. But, and I'm like, why would I do that? Now I'm making less money. (laughs) (laughs) I'm making less money now. (laughs) Exactly. Like what about my car, bro? Yeah, yeah. Like to me that that or for a lot of us that's losing and and that's backwards thinking. But that's right. how our community has been impacted because of the years of not knowing. Right. You know, absolutely. And and with with that goes along with uh the aspect of ownership, bro. Like uh I talked to a lot of different people, a lot of my family members even about renting versus owning. And even mm-hmm. something like that. They're like, man, why would I want to own? You know, if I own it, then I'm I'm liable for it. And I'm like, yes, you're liable for it, but you actually, once you, you own it, you're not paying somebody else. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, when it comes down to it, it's it's a complete shift, and you're hitting it right on the nail with, with it. It's it there's a complete shift that needs to take place um, because, and I don't know, I don't know if it was a purposeful um, brainwashing that made us think that ownership was, you know, a burden. Um, or if, you know, not are teaching us that, you know, we shouldn't own our neighborhoods. 
Um, but definitely, we we have to, bro. At this point. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, yeah, like I, I'm not gonna try to act like I'm a historian, but from what I understand. It, I mean, like you said, we had Black Wall Street. We had, you know, cities that were completely running on Black business and everything in the South. But the issue is that there were so many policies and legislation that put into place that blocked a lot of people from making it more widespread. Right. Now, what happened with the people? Because they obviously had the knowledge. What happened with those people? Where did that information get disconnected? I think, you know, that is a huge <laughs> conversation that is hard to prove. And that's why we have so much issues with racism now. It's hard to really factually prove it to people, especially if they don't look at the history. It's like, it's not just this one thing. It's multiple things they did to throw our community off track. Right. And so, you know, whether you're talking about mass incarceration, whether you're talking about um, tobacco companies have admitted many times, like the purposeful marketing to our community, alcohol, all that stuff, like they really destroyed our communities. And so in that process, I just think we lost from those leaders who knew what they were doing. We lost kind of that mentality to own and to make our own thing. Right. And then I think some of that too, and I don't want to get too far into the, cause I, I think a lot of it was sabotage. I mean, just to be honest with you, and I don't want to get too far into that. I think that's, it may be on the scope of this conversation, but uh, definitely when you look at the, the way that our leaders were uprooted from our communities, um, mm -hmm. a lot of times organizations that were for our benefit were either completely destroyed or uh, transferred into something different. You know, um, I, I think that there's a little bit of sabotage there because there was way too much government involvement in in our internal affairs that, you know, other internal, other groups, internal affairs didn't have that same involvement. And then all of a sudden, these groups that were doing such great things in our communities are now part of the problem in our community. So I, I think there's a little bit of that. Um, when you look at things too, there's a lot of mishandling that went on from the government's perspective on like the Freedmen's Bureau. You know, they, they had a lot going there uh, with financial literacy for black folk um, basically at that time. And I think it's in uh, W.E.B. Du Bois book. I think it's called The Soul of, of, of Black Folk. Um, great book. I recommend it if anybody is looking for a good read. But um, he talks about how the Freedmen's Bureau uh, was, was created in, in kind of combined with the land bureau or, or the unclaimed land bureau and the point was to not only get this land to black americans who have been newly or freely uh, released from slavery but to also teach them about how ownership works teach them about how a lot of this stuff works and of, of course a lot of that money and a lot of those resources end up going to white people through mishandling but I, like i said i think a lot of that goes down to um you know there's there's a, a bit of sabotage whether it's purposeful or accidental um, there's no way that, you know, all this information doesn't get passed in some, some form, you know what I mean? And I think also too, it's that aspect of, I mean, look at what happens when as a, as a black man, you do better, you do better, right? What's the first thing that, that, that you're required almost to do? Leave your community, right? You know, you make it, you're almost required to leave that community. You know, uh, whether it's because your, your your drive to get to your job is a long distance or whether it's because, you know, for like myself, I'm getting moved with this position. I mean, they're moving me. I'm in Terre Haute now. You know what I mean? So they're moving me around a different position. So um, I just feel, man, it's, it's definitely like this. Man, it, there's something to it, man. And, and like I said, I can't say whether it's purposeful or accidental, but it's something. Yeah. It, yeah, it's... it's um... There's a lot to unpack, and that's that's always going to be the, I think, for a long time, that's going to be the situation. But um, I think um, just kind of looking ahead and talking about um, going forward for uh, the younger generation, it, it usually always comes back to education for me. I, I mean, I think um, mandating things in our uh, high school education or K-12 education but that's always hard because people fight back so much and it's usually state by state. But I think at this point, 
we should have some type of financial literacy that's mandatory, not because we have uh, non-for-profit groups that do classes. We got all types of resources, but for younger students, they, you know, they're not going to seek that out. I, I, I would like to see it where it's like put in the classroom to actually be a part of something they have to do. And throughout, I mean, it could start small and then by the end of high school, it could be more complicated. But I think it's simple concepts. Like, I don't really even think it takes a long time to uh, help students understand it. It's just that a lot of times that info is not available. Right. And I mean, I 100% agree that um, it, in our schools, it, there needs to be a mandatory financial literacy class. And I've actually spoke to some, some friends about this who are also in education like yourself. Um, they work here at Indiana State and they were like talking about going into schools and offering like teaching you how to do your taxes, teaching you about setting up a checking account, savings account, things that when you're in a in certain communities, you know, um, one thing to look at is when you're in, let's say, the black community or a lower income community, you don't have a whole lot of financial institutions even. You know, you got to check in the cash, right? You got a uh, place where you can do currency exchange, things of that nature, but a place where you can actually go because financial institutions actually offer that you can come in and talk to them, you know, but if they're not in your community and nobody's coming from outside of your community and teaching you this, where are you getting this information from? So making it that every student has to, just like we got to go through constitution classes and pass the constitution mm -hmm. test, every student should be required to pass financial literacy before entering the 10th grade or 11th, whatever grade it is. As soon as they get to that working age, they should be required to learn about how money works and not just from a bare, hey, you know, you get money, you spend it on stuff, but teach them about how money has velocity. You know, how if you, you know, when, if you, the more money you get, the more money you spend, you know, teach them about stuff yeah. that I had to learn from 10 years of making mistakes. You know what I mean? Right. If I wish I would have known this at 18, man, I would be wealthy at this point. But, you know, because of the fact that a lot of this stuff, I just learned being on quarantine. You get what I'm saying? Where I had extra yeah. time to look into some of this, you know, and say, man, why am I, why is my money not working the way I want it to? You know, or... Yeah learning it a couple years back or whatever it was, but, you know, or learning about how buying a house while I'm buying a house. I should have known about that before I ever even bought a house. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's just, we it needs to be done, especially in our community. Yeah. Where, you know, uh, some of us are the first generation is buying houses. You know what I mean? So. It, yeah, it's so tough. Like, but, uh, yeah, I agree. I understand the, you know, the kind of the obstacles it, it takes to get that type of legislation pushed in education, but it needs to. And I know the truth of the matter is it doesn't benefit any of these people in America to teach their citizens that they right. want you to not know, especially certain groups. And so it, it profits for them. But I think if we, like we always should do in a democracy, hold people accountable for what we want, those are some of the things, but um, I, I, I agree with you, um, especially as a federal mandate. Like we always talk about the constitution. It definitely should be something where well, we got like econ cause uh, I took AP economics and that's where I first, that was my senior year of high school. That's when I first started learning like a lot of stuff and economics can be taught in like junior high. I mean, right. the the younger they are, the easier the examples are where, you know, you could talk about supply and demand and these types of things. They don't have to be, you know, real in depth, but that's, that's stuff that people should learn as consumers pretty early on. And then, like we said, in high school, you should be able to have to pass certain things. Um, but right. I, I think that's where it starts is this disconnect of information into the community as far as how come we are impacted that way and right. um you know the country runs on a group of uneducated people whether yeah, you know I just get ready to say something about that brother yeah because like well my biggest thing is like i understand the impact of race but my biggest thing is socioeconomic status is our biggest you know division lines because mm -hmm. there's poor white people that they manipulate as well as well as, you know, uh, the impoverished neighborhoods of African-Americans to, 
you know, either vote like we got Trump in because a lot of the poor white people came out for that and all these different things. So they prey on uneducated people. And I think it's up to the people who are educated and who know to start pushing policy to help us. So we're pushing the bar up. The bar hasn't been pushed up in so long that we just had the same cycles in these places where people don't know, they grow up, they don't teach their kids, they grow up, they don't teach their kids, and that's kind of how we end up here. Oh, absolutely. And, and the thing about, like, you, you hit it on the nail, I mean, when you're talking about um, capitalism, right, which is the way that this country works, not necessarily a pure capitalist country, but mostly capitalism. Um, capitalism only functions if you can keep a class system and mm -hmm. um, that you can keep the lower class working hard for you, but not understanding things for themselves to a point where they can get it themselves. So, cause I mean, a lot of these, and uh, when you, when you get, when you break it down, you talk about poor whites in America, you talk about poor black people in America, and you talk about how does that contribute to the rich? And, and then we see it even through this pandemic you know, the essential workers, you know what I mean? And, and I put air quotes on that because um, these jobs that the essential workers were doing were absolutely needed to be done to keep the economy afloat. But yet these are some of the lowest paid wages of people that had to go to work, could not take off time during a pandemic because of the fact that the way that our country runs is from lower income or lower class people putting in the sweat. And then the people above having the know-how and knowing how to manipulate the manipulate everything in a way that works best for them and the wealth flows upward. So if we were to teach financial literacy to um, to all people, and because I do think there's this level of um, let's keep this information to ourselves. I think that's a little bit of what's going on with why black people haven't gotten the information right readily. Why poor whites, you know, typically if you run into a poor white person, their, their parents were poor. Their grandparents were poor. So it's systematic. You know, they, they've been mm -hmm. poor for generations just like a lot of us have been poor for generations. And they've been purposely kept that way because it's not beneficial to those who have the wealth to teach others how to obtain that wealth because then you become their competition. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely time, uh, especially as we, as a country, see, you know, with the wealth gap increasing, you know, the, the poorest people are becoming poorer and the richest people become richer and the middle class is shrinking daily. Um, we definitely need to do something about that because we can't function in a, there's just poor, there's just rich and that's, that's as far as it goes. You know, we need that middle class and we need to make sure that middle class is healthy. Yeah, I think um, to wrap it up, looking forward, kind of what I said earlier, and then you can add your thoughts. I think we are starting in the right direction with this idea of trying to control the power of the black dollar. Obviously, it's always hard to get a group of people to move in one direction, but I think this conversation, the concept of it even being a topic is important. Even if you got 10 year olds, eight year olds that don't know what it really means, they're forced to sit here at home right now. They're seeing people talk about it they can ask questions or they can Google it, they can start learning. And I think that being in the ether is the, the start. But then, like I said, the next step is the conversation of ownership. And that's starting with music, really. Um, right. Which is probably the easiest place to do it because athletes is, you know, that's too big of an infrastructure. You can't, you, you can't really own something when you getting paid by the owner. So he obviously has more money than you. But with music, like you're getting paid based off the fans. Like the fans right. are the ones that's giving you that money. So you got Chance uh, putting out his stuff independently. You got a lot of rappers and musicians getting their masters. People didn't even know what masters was. They didn't even know that they could own their music and what that even meant. And so I think music is talking a lot about ownership and that eventually will be, a, and you got Tyler Perry. I don't like none of his stuff, but I appreciate his, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I appreciate his, um, what he's doing. Cause that's the conversation that's going to be next level, but going ahead, how do you feel about where we are? Um, I'm actually very uh, enthusiastic about where we are personally. Um, seeing, you know, cause I talk a lot on Facebook about 
investing and, you know, kind of get, try to just get a little information out there. Seeing the interest of, of people is uh, intriguing because for a long time you talk about investing, people are like that you're speaking a foreign language, you know? So people are, st- are definitely starting to get into that place where there's an interest for it. And there's the understanding that there's a need, you know, we're seeing where, where it's necessary and where it's beneficial. Um, so that kind of gives me a lot of hope. Uh, the other side of that, when you when you just break it down, bring it all together, the excitement comes in where I see us actually doing what it's going to take to get there, which means we have to take it upon ourselves. And I'm seeing that the amount of uh, young brothers like yourself who are talking about this, the young the amount of brothers like myself who are out in the street. You know, I'm talking to people who uh, are in low income neighborhoods about investing, about what they could be doing with the money better than getting rims or better than trying to get this and get that. And so it just takes that groundwork. It takes for us to say enough is enough. Um, we're no longer going to sit back and wait for those who have to reach out a hand and help us get it. We're going to get it ourselves, you know? And so, so that's kind of where I'm at. That's why I'm seeing we're at as a people and that's, it's exciting, brother. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. We're going to wrap up there. Uh, Definitely stick around. We'll talk. But um, for everybody else, go to the comment section. Let me know what you think about the conversation. Anything you want to add? uh, Any thoughts on it? Um, Share it around. Get the conversation started. Thumbs up. Subscribe. And thank you for going out of bounds.